Amen. Amen. All right, tonight we're continuing our study, of course, in the book of Genesis. We're in Genesis chapter number 43. It's going to be the same story as well. And as I mentioned last week, this storyline is really going to carry us through to the end of the book of Genesis. Uh, I would summarize Genesis chapter 42 through 45 as the reuniting or the reunion of Joseph and his brethren. And right now here, really, the next two chapters is really where things start to get very, very very interesting. Last chapter, chapter number 42, is when the famine hit hard. Jacob sent, you know, uh, uh, the ten sons. Obviously, Joseph is not, according to Jacob. And then uh, Benjamin, he kept behind. So he sent his other ten sons down into Egypt to get corn and to get bread. Uh, when they arrive, Joseph is, of course, the governor, the ruler, and they have no idea. And he is the ruler over the storehouses. They come to get bread. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. And he really, he starts to devise this on the spot, it seems, uh, this really elaborate plan um, where he's just basically messing with his brethren. And at that point, you know, he ended up basically accusing them of being spies. And he took all of them, put them in jail, and was going to leave them in jail and then send one. But then he reversed it and he only kept one and sent the rest and said, hey, go get your other brother and then come back. They purchased the food. When they purchase the bread or the, you know, it's, it's really, in, it's corn, it's, it's, it's wheat is what it is in the grain. He gives them their sacks full and he sends them on their way. Well, while they're on their way, they find out that their money was put back into their sack. They, one of the brethren goes to, of their brothers goes to open up the sack and he realizes his money in there. Of course, they're terrified because they're already on thin ice with the ruler of Egypt, Right. So they're terrified. They get back. They tell Jacob about everything that had taken place. And Jacob's like, there's no way you're taking Benjamin. It's not happening. So that's basically how the last chapter ended. Let's jump in here in Genesis chapter number 43, verse number 1. The Bible says, And the famine was sore in the land. Now the word sore is used oftentimes in the Bible. It just means severe or it means very bad. We wouldn't use the word sore like that, but it's used very many times in the Bible like this. It just means like very bad or it means severe in this case. So this implies to me that the famine has got much worse. It has worsened than how it was before. It says in verse number two, and it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, go again buy us a little food. I think this plays in with verse 1 and tells us that the famine was very, very bad. Now, the amount of money that they took to go down there to buy corn, do you think when they were purchasing the corn, but actually before they got there, because they didn't expect any of that to happen, don't you think that they were trying to purchase enough corn to get them through this famine? Of course, they didn't know it was going to be seven years, but of course, they're trying to purchase a lot of corn or a lot of bread. And notice, they ran out. That shows you that this is a very severe famine. So he says this, he says, uh, Go again, this is when they're totally out of corn, they're totally out of bread, go again, buy us a little food. So he's telling them to go again and buy them, buy them some more corn, back to Egypt where they were. Verse 3, and Judah spake unto, the, unto him, saying, The man did solemnly. Now, solemn means like seriously, earnestly. He's not kidding. He's very serious. Did solemnly protest unto us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. So, Judah is just reminding Jacob. Now, Jacob already knows this. But what's going on right now is Jacob is being irrational, right? The, Jacob looks at the food supply and he realizes we have to have food. There's no way around it. We must have food, right? But is Jacob willing to give up Benjamin? No. So he just like, he's being irrational. He just totally forgets about how, you know, he's trying to avoid that completely that they must bring back Benjamin. And he's just like, hey, go get us food. When they had already explained to him, hey, the guy said we, he, that he is not going to give us anything and don't, see, don't come back to, to, to see me again. You're not going to see my face unless you bring your brother with you. Right? So Jacob, at this point, like he said, you know, uh, Simeon is not because Simeon was the brother that got left behind. Simeon, uh, it seems like, has just been totally forgotten. He's not taking Benjamin with him. He's not worried about that, right? Because he does not want to give up Benjamin. Because, of course, as I mentioned, uh, Joseph was his favorite. Benjamin seems to be replacing him now. 
uh, now that he, he uh, you know, is under the impression that, that uh, um, uh, Joseph is not, or that he has died, and he is not willing to give up Benjamin. And that's, of course, because uh, he loves Joseph and Benjamin so much because he loves Rachel, and it is the offspring of Rachel. Look there with me at verse number 4 now. It says, If thou wilt send, this is Judah still speaking, If thou wilt send our brother with us, that's Benjamin, we will go down and buy thee food. So he's saying, hey, we'll go, Father. We are willing to go, but you have to send Benjamin. We're not going, because they were there and they saw Joseph. Remember it says that he spake, very, he spake roughly unto them, right? So they saw, like, this guy's serious. He has a lot of power. He solemnly protested. That's how Judah perceived it. He knows, hey, he's not going to give us anything unless we bring our brother with us, right? So Judah's trying to explain to him, hey, I'm willing to go, but you must give us Benjamin. Look at verse number 5. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. Wilt not go down. I'm sorry, will. We will not go down. For the man said unto us, ye shall not, ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. Verse 6. And Israel said, <clears throat> Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me? So he's saying, Why did you deal so badly with me? As to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother. This is so rough on Jacob, as I mentioned, because Jacob does not want to you know, lose Benjamin. He's saying, Why did you even mention that you had another brother? And he's saying you know, that this is them dealing badly with him, right? Or ill, like the Bible uh, uses the word there. Look at verse 7. And they said, the man asked us straightly, like that means like clearly, right? Of our, of our state and, and of our kindred, saying, is your father yet alive? And here's another question. Have ye another brother? So they, he says he asked very clearly, and you could also, uh, straightly there also means like strict. So it's saying, you know, he asked us very straightly, very clearly, very bluntly, how, you, know, you know, he asks of the father, how's it, how's it worded? Is your father yet alive? And then they say, and then he says, have ye another brother? So he asks this very clearly. Then he says this, and we told him according to the tenor of these words. Could we certainly know that he would say, bring your brother down? So Judah's saying, how would I have known when he asked the question? And he asked me very clearly and very straightforward, is your father yet alive? And do you have another brother? He's saying, how would I have known that he was going to say, hey, go get your other brother and bring him down, right? So he's explaining to his father, hey, I'm not throwing you under the bus here. I'm not trying to set you in a, up in a bad situation. He asked us the question very clearly and very straightly, and we wouldn't have known that he was going to say this. Look at verse number 8. And Judah said unto Israel, his father, send the lad with me, and we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we... And then he says this, and thou and also our little one. So Judah's saying, hey, just give me the lad so that we don't die. He's saying this is basically the only way that we're going to be able to survive. Only Egypt has food. If you remember, prior to this, before they went and got their first you know, uh, uh, um, uh, ration of food, they... And all the nations were coming to Egypt, weren't they? All the nations, it says, were coming. So that, that, that tells me this. There's nowhere else to go. That is the only resource of food. And he's saying, hey, if we don't go to Egypt, we're going to die. So give me the lad and we'll go down to Egypt and, and so that we, you know, all of, the, all of the brethren, you speaking to Jacob, and he says, and our little ones. So Jacob's grandsons and all of the tribes... You know, the, the 11 brothers, all of their children. He's saying so that we can all stay alive, right? All of Israel at this time. Look at verse 9. He says, I will be surety for him. Now, surety is, is the word uh, uh, in the Bible that's often used as well with surety is pledge. Someone like gives a pledge. He's basically saying like, I'll be the pledge. If you remember when Judah went and slept with Tamar and he thought her to be a harlot, he gave her a pledge, right? He's basically telling Jacob right now, hey, I'll be the pledge. I'll be the surety, right? You know, uh, an, another word that we use is, is uh, uh, collateral. We use the word collateral, you know, in more of like a legal type of setting. He's basically saying, I'll be the collateral is pretty much what he's saying here. So he says, I will be surety for him. Of my hand shalt thou require him. He's saying, I will be accountable. I'll be the one that is responsible. If I bring him not unto thee and set him before thee, then let me bear the blame forever. 
Verse 10, For except we had lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. So he's saying if we wouldn't have waited around or lingered, you know, we would have returned this second time. Or he's saying we could have already been back by now, right? So he, if, it's funny, he's either, if he's speaking about the first time, which I don't think he does, if he's speaking about the first time that they had this conversation about going down, because they didn't need food then, that's why I don't think he's, he's asking about that, well then, that makes sense. But I think he's being uh, facetious here. He's saying... Because they're just having this conversation right now. There's no reason to believe that this conversation you know, is broken up over you know, a course of months or anything like that. They said this here and then this there. So he's basically being facetious. He's saying, hey, if we wouldn't have been waiting around, we could have been back by now, which is an exaggeration. It's obviously you know, uh, you know, a hyperbole. You really, he, they wouldn't have really been back, but he's trying to prove the point. Like, hey, we can get down there faster if you would just say go, right? So if we wouldn't have lingered, surely now we had returned this second time. Look at verse number 11. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now. So notice that he really does not want Benjamin to go. He's saying, if it has to be this way. If it must be so now. Then he says this. Do this. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels. And carry down the man a present. A little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Peradventure, it was an oversight. Now I want to remind you about something uh, which I'm sure you remember, and you've probably been aware of a lot of the things that I've taught throughout the past couple of weeks, of the symbolism of Joseph and Jesus. And we're going to be looking at that again here more so here in just a minute uh, with a couple of other uh, interesting thing that's taught in the, things that are taught in this particular chapter that strongly symboli symbolize uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph symbolizing the Lord Jesus Christ. One thing that's very interesting right here is they're, they're taking uh, uh, down all of these things which are meant to be gifts. And they're bringing them to Joseph, right? Well, if you think of this in regards to Jesus, notice what he says there. He says, says And their father Israel said to them, If it must be so now, he says this, Do this. Take of the best fruits in the land uh, in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices and myrrh, nuts and almonds. And take double money in your hand and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sack. So notice when Jacob tells his sons to go pick something out that they're going to be bringing to Joseph, who's be, of course, picturing Jesus, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to bring the best. He says, hey, go get the best. Think about when they brought a sacrifice to the tabernacle. Who are they offering that to? They're offering that to the Lord, right? It's only one God, Jesus. They're offering it to God. Right? And what do they have to offer? What are they told to offer? Hey, don't go pick out the, the, the one with the blemishes. Don't go pick out the one with all these problems. Right? You need to offer the best unto the Lord. Right? So right here, what are they giving to Joseph? Picturing Jesus. They're giving him the best. And this is how we should be in our lives as well. We shouldn't be, you know, giving Jesus the short end of the stick. Hey, with whatever little time that I have left, Jesus, I'll give you that. You know, you know, this little bit of time that I have here to memorize Scripture, this little bit of time, I'll try to squeeze you in, or I'll try to pencil you in here and there. Or, you know, we should be trying to set Jesus, we should be trying to set God at the top of our priorities list. We should be giving Him the best. He should be receiving the best in our lives. And oftentimes, church... And our spirituality, you know, uh, prayer time, all of these types of things are put down at the bottom of the list. When really, God should be getting the best. He should not be down here, down at the bottom. Whatever we have left over, whatever fruits, whatever almonds are left over, the ones that are rotten and, you know, don't look all that good, that's what we'll bring to you. No, that's not how it should be. Just like Joseph received the best, Jesus should get the best. We should give him the best. We should give him everything that we have. You know, as far as our efforts go, you know, uh, we should be putting our priorities, or we should be putting our effort into, you know, serving God. That's where our effort should be. That's where our, our heart should be, is serving God. Not just, hey, this is what I have left over. You know, hey, I have this little bit of time here, so I'll make sure that I do this for you. That's not how it should be. That should be at the top of our priorities list when we're serving God. 
And then he says this in verse 12, And take double money in your hand, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sack. So he wants them to take double money. Now what is he comparing that to? Of course the money that they brought down originally, right? So initially the amount of money that they brought down that that was enough to purchase for their, for each person to have the sack that they had. So double that, that amount of money and then also he says this, and the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks. Now what was brought again in the mouth of their sacks? It was the money that was used to purchase that. So, this is how much money that they're bringing back with them now. Three times the amount that they had before. Double the amount that they brought, and then also the amount that was put back in their sacks. And what was that? They said, hey, he restored unto us our money. That's saying the same amount of money that they had before. So it's three times the amount of money that they had with them when that they brought with them the first time when they went down to purchase the corn. Look there at, at the end of verse number 12. We're going to finish reading. It says, And the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carried again in your hand, peradventure it was an oversight. Saying, perhaps. Peradventure means like perhaps it was an oversight. Saying that someone, we, would, we normally say overlooked it. Hey, sorry, I overlooked that, right? It's just another way of saying the same thing. Saying maybe they accidentally overlooked it and they accidentally put that money back in there. Just in case. Now, notice that Jacob is, you know, he thinks that that's a possibility. Now, what did they think? They were like, God has done this to us, right? They said that immediately. Why? Because they were guilty. If you remember, this was a theme all throughout the last chapter. They were guilty about what they had done to Joseph, and they felt confident God has done this to us. But Jacob's like, hey, it's, it's you know, peradventure, it's an, it's an oversight, right? Because he's not in the same frame of mind as they are. They're thinking, hey, this is the punishment from God. So he's saying, hey, maybe it was just they overlooked it, right? Look at verse number 13. Take also your brother and arise, go again unto the man. So he tells him, go ahead and take Benjamin. So he officially says, go ahead and take Benjamin with you. Verse 14. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. So their other brother was Simeon. Remember, that's who he kept. Joseph put him in ward. He put him in prison. It says that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. He says, if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. The word bereaved means like deprived. He's saying if I'm deprived of my children, I am deprived. He's basically saying if I'm deprived of my children, my children are taken from me, then I'm completely deprived. He's saying I have nothing left, right? You see the importance of his children. That's what he means by that. One thing that's interesting, I want you to uh, flip back to Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17. You would notice there in Genesis 43, 14, he says, and God Almighty give you mercy. So notice he's blessing them uh, um, in the name of the Lord and specifically he says, and God Almighty. Now this phrase is not used that many times, but I'll show you uh, where it is introduced. And that's Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17, we're going to look at verse number 1. Genesis 17 verse 1. The Bible reads, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So you'll notice when this name is actually introduced, it is by God himself. I want you now to turn with me to Genesis chapter number 28. Genesis chapter number 28, we'll see this mentioned again. Genesis chapter number 28. <clears throat> Genesis chapter number 28, <clears throat> this is Isaac speaking. Verse number 3, it says, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee. Now this is Isaac speaking unto Jacob. Now where did Abraham get the name God Almighty? Where did he hear it? Well, of course, from where we read Genesis 17, from God himself. God revealed this name to Abraham. Now, where did Isaac get it? From Abraham, of course. Of course, Abraham heard that from God and then referred to him as God Almighty. So notice that he taught this to his son Isaac. And then, what does Jacob refer to him as? He says, and God Almighty give you mercy. Now, where did, where did Jacob learn this from? From Isaac. So notice how there is the tradition, a biblical tradition, you know, that's being taught, that's being uh, passed down, I'm sorry, being taught from one generation 
to the next. I want you to look with me, uh, also look at Genesis chapter number 35. One other time we'll see this. Genesis chapter number 35. These are pretty much the only times, um, at least on this side of Genesis 43. There's a couple more later in the latter portion of the book of Genesis. But look with me at Genesis chapter number 35. We'll see it one more time here. Genesis 35, this is Jacob speaking. Genesis 35, look at verse number 11. And God said unto him, I, I'm sorry, it's, it's God speaking to Jacob. And God said unto him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So notice he's receiving the blessing there, and God himself again refers to himself as God Almighty. This is, of course, after Isaac had already even blessed Jacob calling God, God Almighty. So you can see this is important. God refers to himself by this name a few different times. We see Isaac referring to him by the name uh, God Almighty. And this is a name. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses will try to say, oh, you know, God is not a name. God Almighty is not a name. Uh, the book of Exodus, God clearly says that he was known unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by my name. He says, God Almighty. He says, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. So it is a name. Some people just think, hey, God's not a name. Well, God says that God is a name. According to God, it is a name. God Almighty is a name. That's found in Exodus, I believe, chapter number 6. Exodus chapter 6. So go back to Genesis chapter 43 with me. Verse number 14. We'll read one more time. He says, And God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Look at verse 15. And the men took that present, and they took double money in their hand, and Benjamin, and rose up, and went down to Egypt, and stood before Joseph. So in this situation, obviously what they're doing is they're wanting to return the double money for the money that they were given, right? So the money that they were given back. But then also they're bringing some more money, which was just one time of what they had before, right? If you were to just times that one time, it's the same amount they brought down the first time. And that is to purchase more food. That's why they're bringing that down. But then also they're bringing down the balm you know, uh, the best of the fruits, it says the honey, the spices, all of that stuff, the myrrh, the almonds, the nuts, that's going to be a gift. That's supposed to be the best of the land and that's going to be given to Joseph as a gift. To try to, of course, buy favor in Joseph's eyes. Look there at uh, verse number <clears throat> uh, 16 now. It says, And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of his house, so the ruler of his house, of course, would be his steward, is what the Bible referred to that particular office. It says, bring these men home and slay and make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. I want you to go ahead and turn to Luke chapter number 22, verse number 7. Luke chapter number 22, verse number 7. Now, in a sermon I preached uh, not too long ago where I was talking about some of the typology of Jesus' ministry in the Old Testament, I pointed this out. And this is the typology of the Passover in the Old Testament here. I want to point out a couple of other uh, small additional things as well. I want you to go with me, as I said, to Luke 22, and we'll read the passage about the Passover in the Gospel of Luke. I want you to look here with me at Luke chapter 22, verse number 7. Notice the wording here. It says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. So notice, the Passover must be killed. Now I want to put this in your mind too, because this is very interesting. Where did the Passover take place? The actual Passover, where did it take place? It took place in Egypt, right? Where the, where the death angel passed over all of the homes and didn't kill the firstborn where the blood was on the lintel and the side post, right? That's actually where the Passover began. Where is Joseph at right now? Where are all of his brethren? They're in Egypt, of course. So they're showing up in Egypt. So that's interesting that this is actually taking place where the Passover begins itself. Now, here, of course, where they're celebrating the Passover, this continued on as a tradition uh, on into the land of Canaan when they founded the nation of Israel. Uh, but that's the purpose of the Passover. That's what they're celebrating. So it says, Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. Verse 8, and he sent Peter and John saying, go, prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, where wilt thou that we prepare? 
And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in, and ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover? And he says, With my disciples. Verse 12, And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. So there's very uh, uh, similar language that's used in both of these passages, right? It tells us in Genesis chapter number 43, when he's speaking to his steward, and remember, they're going to the good man of the house, right? The disciples are. He tells them, hey, slay, and he says, and make ready. Now, what is the Passover? It says the time that they must kill the Passover. So what are they slaying, right? They're obviously killing something there. Then it says, make ready. Well, what language did Jesus use? He says in verse number 12 of Luke 22, if you're still there, and he shall show you a large upper room furnished, and he says there, make ready. Now, I pointed this out in that sermon. How many people are showing up? You have 11 of the brethren of... It would be 11 now, now that Simeon is given back to them, right? So it was 10, now Simeon's back. So 11 of the brethren, and then you have Joseph, which is 12. And then, of course, who does Joseph picture as well? Jesus, right? So you have the 12 tribes of Israel, which are very often in the Bible paralleled with the 12 disciples. So in the New Testament here, they're sitting down, they're celebrating the Passover. They're killing and they're making ready. There's a man that's getting the room ready, right? You have, as I said, the 12 disciples and you have Jesus. Well, in the Old Testament, you have a man that's getting the room ready. You have him saying, make ready. You have him slaying, right? You have Joseph, which would be pictured by Jesus, and then you, have the, you would have the uh, tribes of Israel there, right? Eleven of them, and then Joseph being the twelfth as well. You double Joseph for his typology also on top of that, right? Look at verse number 13, Luke twenty-two, thirteen. 13. It says, And they went and found, as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And then it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down, and it says, And the twelve apostles with him. Now, we're going to be coming back to uh, that passage just shortly, and I want to uh, cross-reference a couple of other things. But go back for now. You can go ahead and drop that. Go back to Genesis 43. We may go to Matthew 27 instead of Luke 22 next time. <clears throat> and notice it said, too, that Joseph made this statement, For these men shall dine with me at noon. So this is actually coming out of Joseph's mouth. He said, These men shall dine with me. Do you know the only other time that someone says, you know, that they're going to dine with someone. Do you know who he says it to? And you know who it is? Jesus, in John chapter number uh, 20, I believe, is, uh, is the chapter. It's 19 or 20. I believe it's 20. John chapter number 20, after he's risen from the dead, he goes when they're out on the boat. Remember, you know, it says that, that, that Peter, you know, got his fisher coat for he was naked, right? And he dives in the water and swims over. And you know what Jesus says? It's where we get the song. He says, come and dine, right? Joseph and Jesus are the only people that make that statement in the entire Bible. Right here we see him say, they're going to dine with me. Notice he says, at noon. What did it tell us in Luke 22? That they were there and then they waited for the hour to come. So they're waiting for this exact time, right? Just like they're doing. They're waiting on Joseph. Joseph doesn't arrive right away. They're sat there and then they just wait. What did the disciples do? He told them, hey, go there and I want you just to wait there. And then I'm going to come. Go make ready. They go in, they sit down, and then they wait. It's very interesting. Look at verse 18. It says, And the men were afraid because they were brought into Joseph's house. And they said, Because of the money that was returned in our sacks at, this, at the first time are we brought in, that he may seek occasion against us. So he's seeking an opportunity is what it's saying, right? He's seeking the perfect opportunity to try to, uh, and it tells you right here, and fall upon us and take us for bondmen and our asses. So he's saying, He's trying to set us up. He's bringing us into, our, into his house where we're vulnerable. And then he's just going to bring all these people in. They're going to fall us like attack us. He's going to turn us into bondmen. And he says, and they're going to take our asses. Now, what, why do they keep thinking these things? Why are they thinking that that's going to happen? Because they're guilty. Notice what they said that he's going to make them too. Isn't that interesting? Right? He said they're going to make us into bondmen. Why? What did they do to Joseph? They made him into a bondman. So you can see that this is just deep-seated in their mind. 
This is the importance of confessing your sins and not just carrying them around with you all the time because they won't go away. They're just gonna, you have the Holy Ghost living inside of you on top of it, but your sins are just going to continually torment you all the time. And you're just going to feel guilty constantly. You know, you, you're, you know you're gonna, you're, something's going to happen. You're going to get hurt or whatever it may be. And you're just not going to be able to move past them. And they'll just continually torment you in your mind. You'll never get peace, right? Anything that ever happens, you're going to be thinking that something, you know, and it, sometimes it is probably a punishment. I'm sure in this case, it is somewhat of a punishment. God's probably using this, right? And, and punishing them in that way. They deserve a punishment. Of course, he shows them mercy by and large. But this is why you need to confess your sins and not just carry them around. You need to get things right. If you have something wrong in your life, you need to confess the sins. You need to go to the person that you've done wrong like the Bible teaches. You know, apologize, repent, get that relationship right. And then the Bible talks about then you can go and offer a gift to God if you want, right? Then you can start serving Him in your fullest capacity and get that weight or that you know, burden off of your shoulders so you can move forward. right? Because it's never going to go away. It doesn't matter how many years go by. How many years it went by at this point? right? We add it up. It's like, it's like a, 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 a 23 years. It's more than that now because they went back. And of course, it would have been a couple of years into the famine. So it would have been a, it's probably been 27 years roughly. Two years into the famine the first time. Once they start to experience the famine, they need to go down about one to two years and they need to get food. They go back, let's give them another year. It takes a long time to travel back and forth like that. So roughly three to four years. It's around 26, 27 years. And all they can think about is what they did to Joseph. Do you want to have a sin in your life for 25 years and that's all you can think about? Think, I mean, that's terrible. Do you think this is the first time that, they, that this has crossed their mind? When you stop thinking about things, it goes away. You'll for, you really do forget things when you just don't think about them anymore, right? If you recall memories repeatedly throughout your life, that's it, how you're able to retain those memories. You know, if you, as, as a, a seven-year-old, you think about the things you did when you were three, and 11-year-old, then you keep thinking about them, you'll retain the memories. But if you stop thinking about something entirely, that's how you ultimately, it will completely vanish out of your mind. You'll completely forget it. You know what that tells me? They were continually thinking about this all the time. And look at how it's tormenting them and just tearing them apart. What All he did was just, hey, come in, I want you to eat with me. And what are they doing? They're just conjuring up all these ideas. He's about to kill us. He's getting ready to kill us. You can see they're panicked. They're anxious. Why? Because they have this unconfessed, unrepented sin that they've been carrying around with them for 25, 26, 27 years. Right? That's a long time to be living miserable like this. You know what that tells you? You need to learn from this and you need to get these things right as soon as possible. If you have some kind of sin that you're thinking of in your mind while I'm preaching this right now, yes, I'm preaching to you. You need to go home and you need to get this sin right. You need to pray to God, confess the sin. If Maybe if there's someone that you've wronged, you need to apologize to that person as well and make this right. Look at verse number 19. And they came near to the steward... Remember, that's the man, of course, that is uh, the ruler of his house. The steward of Joseph's house. And they communed with him at the door of the house and said, Oh, sir, we came indeed down at the first time to buy food. And it came to pass, excuse me, when we came to the inn, that we opened our sacks and behold, every man's money was in the mouth of his sack. Our money in full weight. And we have brought it again in our hand. And other money have we brought down in our hands to buy food. Saying we brought it back and we brought more down this time to buy food. We cannot tell who put our money in our sacks. He's saying we can't tell because we don't know. It's just his way of saying, hey, we don't know who put the money in our sacks. Verse 23, here's the steward responding. And he said, peace be to you. Fear not. Your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. He says, I had your money. So he was the man that was commissioned with this work, right? It was his steward that did this before. It says, and he brought Simeon out unto them. So I'm sure this was a great relief, right? And they're like, Phew, man. Now, what's very interesting is it never tells you specifically why he put the money in their sack this time. Of course, People that are familiar with the story know that he does something very similar again. You know, he, he puts the, the, the silver cup, his particular cup, in there. Right? But he never tells you why he did it. And of course it is because he didn't want them to leave and just never come back again. 
That's not what Joseph desired. He doesn't, he doesn't punish them specifically for this taking this money this time. It never gets brought up again, ever. This, this is it, 100%. Do you know why he gave them the money? Because he wanted to make sure that they came back. Right? So even, you'll notice this over and over again, and of course the way in which Joseph at the end is able to forgive his brethren for what wickedness they did to him, you'll see that he was able to take the higher road. Even though they had done, such, had, you know, done something so horrible to him and treated him so poorly, he, was, he still desired to see them again, didn't he? He didn't want it just to end where he's being mean to them and, and, and treating them roughly. I'm sure he was enjoying it. You know, when he's speaking roughly unto them after what they had done to him, right? But he wanted them to come back. He, he obviously wanted them to come back. And he had a plan here. And, uh, of course, he wanted to see Benjamin. That's why he told them to bring back his brother. And that was his way to make sure that they came back again. And then they br he brought Benjamin. And I'm going to get into that here in just a moment. Look at uh, verse number 24. It says, and the man brought the men into Joseph's house and gave them water and they washed their feet and he gave their asses provender. Now this is of course another uh, parallel of the typology between the Passover and this meal, uh, this, this, this dinner if you will. It would be lunch because it's noon, but uh, this dinner that they're having with Joseph, right? It's because they're washing their feet. And what did Jesus do unto the disciples? He washed their feet. Notice the, the, the 11 uh, 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 sons of Jacob here, the tribes of Israel, are washing their feet. That happened, of course, at the Passover. In verse number 25, it says, And they made ready the present against Joseph came at noon, for they heard they should eat bread there. Notice what they're eating. They're eating bread. They're eating bread there. What, is, what, do, what do we eat at the Passover? And of course, by extension, the Lord's Supper. Uh, that is actually referred to as the Lord's Supper. What is it that we eat? Bread. Right? We eat bread. So we can see all these strong parallels. Verse number... Another uh, thing of, uh, that I want to point out that's interesting, I skipped over there, is we have a perfect definition of mercy. Uh, in verse number 22, you know, he, he explains how, hey, there's other money. So we brought down this money, we purchased this stuff, and then there's this other money put back into our sacks, the same amount that we had before. And then he just says in verse 23, and he said, Peace be to you, fear not, your God and the God of your father hath given you treasure in your sacks. I had your money. And he brought Simeon out unto them. It's like a perfect example of mercy. Did they deserve that or earn that? He's just like, hey, here's a bonus. You know your money that you had before? Here's your bonus. That's a perfect example of mercy. They did nothing for it. They didn't expect it. They had no idea that they were even going to be given it. Right? They didn't deserve it, for sure. But he gave it to them anyways. It's interesting. Look now at verse number 26. It says this, And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house, and it says, And bowed themselves to him to the earth. Now, I pointed out in the last chapter how the dream from Genesis 37 was fulfilled, right? Now, the dream in Gen from Genesis 37 was the dream that Joseph had where he, that his sheaf is standing upright and then the other 11 are around it and then they bow down, right? Well, I want to retract that partially. Of course, that is somewhat of a fulfillment, but it's not a full fulfillment because I noticed something. How many of his brethren were there? in Genesis 42. Was Benjamin there? He was not. So how many were there? Ten. In the dream, how many sheaves are there? Sheaves. It'd be plural. It tells you eleven. It says, and the eleven, and your sheaves, the eleven, that tells you also people have wondered, hey, was Benjamin alive while Joseph was alive? Yes, it was. Because he says, you're the, the other eleven. Go to Genesis 37, I'll show you. Just so you can help keep this in your mind. Look at Genesis chapter number 37, verse number 9. Here's the second time. We'll read that, this verse. I found it. We'll get back there quickly. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon, and it says, And the eleven stars made obeisance to me. How many? Eleven, not ten. There was only ten brethren that came down the first time in Genesis 42. And I've always heard that preached as, because he, he does say there, Joseph remembered the dream. So it's for sure a partial fulfillment, but it seems to me that the full fulfillment, uh, uh, the literal, let me say it this way too, the literal and immediate full fulfillment takes place here because why? 
the eleven brethren are there. Now, of course, there's a much larger fulfillment where all of the tribes of Israel are all going to bow to Jesus because that's ultimately who the real ruler, the real governor is, and all of Israel is going to worship, is going to worship and serve Jesus one day. But the full fulfillment of that dream is 11 stars, 11 sheaves. They bow. Now how many brethren are here the second time? 11. Notice it said first, Simeon was brought to them. So he's added back, and how many, and who else came with him this time? Benjamin. So it's 11. So now here we can actually see the 11 sheaves or the 11 stars making obeisance. That's what it means to make obeisance is to bow down. It says right here bow, but we'll see obeisance here in just a moment. So verse number 26, we'll read once more. And when Joseph came home, they brought him the present which was in their hand into the house and bowed themselves to him to the earth. So there's the, the full immediate fulfillment of that taking place. Verse 27, And he asked them of their welfare and said, Is your father well? The old man of whom ye spoke, is he yet alive? He's obviously worried about his father. He loves his father. So he's asking this question to make sure, hey, he's still in good health, right? Um, look at verse number 28, And they answered, Thy servant, o our father, is in good health. And notice they're speaking very humbly to him. You know, He's saying that our father, he says, Thy servant, our father. So notice they're referring to their father as his servant, Joseph's servant. Remember it said also that his father and his mother were also going to, right? So that's interesting as well. Notice both these back to back. It says, and they bowed down their heads, look at this, and made obeisance. So there in one verse you basically have the eleven and then you have the father as well. Because remember, uh, uh, Jacob responds to Joseph like, you know, are your brethren or I and your mother going to bow down to you? Right? So you can see even them through words saying, hey, our father's your servant. Look at verse number, uh, verse number 29. It says, And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin. It says, His mother's son. Notice how it's worded there. Obviously, this is why he has a strong connection with Benjamin. And said, Is this your younger brother of whom ye spake unto me? And he said, God be gracious unto thee, my son. Now, I always pictured uh, Joseph right here just because, you know, I'm sure he was... because. The, the following verse as well, I'll read it in just a moment. But I'm sure he was, this was a super big deal to him. He was, the whole reason why he schemed this up in the first place was so that he could see Benjamin. And now he's brought to him, he gets to see him. So I always picture Joseph kind of, you know, kind of uh, stepping out of his character for just a moment and kind of going towards Benjamin. And his brothers are kind of like looking at each other like, why is he acting like this towards our brother? You know, I don't know why when I read it, that's the way that I read it. Because, you know, you can see here in just a moment, the next verse, he's, he's having trouble containing himself. Look at what it says in verse number 30. It says, And Joseph made haste. That means he had to hurry out, right? He hurried or made haste. For his bowels did yearn upon his brother. Now what that means is he's having like... You know, he's having a, you know, a physical reaction here in just a moment. It even goes further. It says this, And he saw it where to weep, and he entered into his chamber and wept, and wept there. So he's having like a physical reaction because of the strong emotions that he's having. It's causing him, his bowels to yearn. He can feel, you know, he's feeling, you know, uh, just all this, these, uh, um, you know, uh, physical types of things because of how emotionally, uh, emotional that he is at this moment. Why? Because he loves his brother so much. And you can understand, this is his only biological brother. I'm sure he loved his mother very much, and that's why it says his mother's son. He cared for and loved his mother very much, so he's thinking of his mother when he's thinking about his biological brother, and this means a lot to him. So, he, you know, he's, he's having to hold himself back to the point he has to hurry out to where he almost cries in front of them. He almost breaks down in tears before them. So maybe that's why I picture him kind of walking towards Benjamin. You know, he's like getting close to him and all the other brothers are like, what in the world is going on? Why is this guy, this stinking weirdo, acting so strange around our brother? That's why I've always pictured because he loved his brother. He obviously cared a lot to the point where he just breaks down and has to leave. And has to, it says he made haste. It's saying he's, he hurried, like almost ran out. You know, and uh, he, he just starts breaking down in tears because he missed his brother so much. Look at the next verse there. It says, And he washed his face and went out and refrained himself and said, Set on bread. So he washed his face. He didn't want them to be able to see that he was crying, that he's distressed and distraught, right? It says, And he went out. It says, And he refrained himself, saying he held himself back. You know, he made sure that he didn't cry any longer. 
and said, set on bread. So he's saying, go ahead and serve us, right? Get the, get the food out. Set on bread. Set the, the, the bread out. It says in verse 32, and they, set on, and they set on for him by himself and for them by themselves and for the Egyptians, which did eat with him by themselves. Because the Egyptians might not eat bread with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Verse 33, and they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men marveled one at another, and he took and sent messes unto them from before him. But Benjamin's mess was five times so much as any of theirs. So they got to be thinking, like, something's weird here, man. Why does he care so much about Benjamin, right? It says this at the very end. It's very interesting because it says this, And they drank and were merry with him. So I don't know if you ever thought this through, but they're sitting there and they're drinking and eating, and Joseph's having a good time with them. And they have no idea that this is their brother. They have no clue. They're laughing. They're joking. They're talking about things about their lives. He's talking about things about his life. And they are having a good time. It says that they were merry with him. So he knows that it's his brethren, right? This is the reunion of, you know, the, the 12 tribes, if you will. This is the reunion of the 12 tribes. And it's very interesting because this is when Benjamin's finally brought, you know. So you, there's the union between Joseph and, and, and Benjamin. The 11 tribes are back. Or the other 10 tribes, I'm sorry, are back. So that's a further union. He gets to see his other 10. Simeon even is brought back. And they get to, and obviously all of them get to finally see Joseph again, although they don't know that it's Joseph. You know, but there's, there still is a reunion that's taking place, this great reunion that's taking place. And keep in mind how this symbolizes. I'm going to show you something very interesting that, that, that uh, occurs in this chapter. Keep in mind how this symbolizes the Passover. And they're sitting there and they're eating bread with him. Just like when the disciples sat down and ate bread and drank and were there you know, with Jesus. And they were merry with him. Now, notice that represents the Passover. Like I said, I want to make this point one more time. Notice where it's taking place at, this particular event, in Egypt, right? Isn't that interesting? Where, where's the origin of the Passover? In Egypt, okay? And we're going to see later on, you know, go ahead and go there, go to Matthew 27. When they are celebrating um, the Passover, you know, this is the Lord's Supper, Jesus tells his disciples, you know, that they're going, we're going to celebrate this meal. It's 26. I'm sorry. It's Matthew 26. <clears throat> I believe. Give me one second. Yeah, it's 26. That we're going to, we're going to have this, this, this type of meal with Jesus in heaven as well. Now, what greater reunion is there than, than when we go to heaven? You know what's going to happen is all of Joseph or Jesus' disciples or his brethren are going to finally be reunited. And Jesus is our brother. The Bible says he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So in the same type of situation with the disciples, the disciples, the Christians, right? They sat down and they supped with Jesus. And they will one day be reunited with Jesus. As we will, as Christians, as disciples, we will be reunited or united with Jesus one day, won't we? In heaven. It's like when Simeon was taken from them and then he was brought back. I'm sure they were celebrating, they were happy. I mean, how great is it going to be when you finally step into heaven? You finally get to see all of your brethren. These are all people that are all covered by the blood of Jesus. We all have the commonality. of We've all trusted in that man that's standing right there. He saved every person that's standing here. And we're all standing there and all of these saved people you've never met. You're going to see all of the people from all of history that have ever lived. Moses, Elijah, Elisha, just all of these people. Jacob, you know, Isaac, Abraham, all of the disciples, Luke. You know, all of these just random you know, saints throughout history are all going to be standing there. And we're all going to be making merry, drinking, having a good time. Notice what Jesus says here in Matthew 26. I want you to look with me, <clears throat> excuse me, Matthew 26. Look at what he says in verse number, um, look at 28 first. He says, for this is my, this is my blood of the New Testament, <clears throat> excuse me, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And he says this in verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day 
when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So notice how he makes this connection between the meal that they're sharing right now, the Passover, the Lord's Supper, with what? A meal that we're going to have in heaven. And then go back to Genesis chapter number 43. And then keep in mind the strong parallel here with the reuniting of brethren, the reuniting of disciples with our master Jesus. And here, what are they doing? They're, they're being invited into the master's house. Now, you've probably heard before where Jesus, of course, in John, I believe it's 15, he says, in my father's house are many mansions. So we're going to go to the father's kingdom, which is referred to as the father's house. We're going to go there. What are we going to do? He says, of the fruit of the vine, I'm not going to drink of it until I drink of it new in the kingdom, right? So there's going to be a time, and he's referring to like what they're doing then. The fruit of this vine, he says. He's talking about this same type of meal we're going to have in heaven. Where? In the Father's house, right? I want you to look here. Real interesting wording. This always stood out to me, but it, I feel like it makes a lot more sense with this typology. Look at how Joseph says this in Genesis 43. Look at verse 16. Back up to verse 16. It says this, And when Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the ruler of, this, of his house, watch this, Bring these men home. Notice that. Bring these men home and slay. <coughs> Excuse me. And make ready, for these men shall dine with me at noon. So notice he didn't say, Bring these men to my house. What did he say? He said, Bring these men home. Bring these men home. And then we look at what's happening. They're seated in who? In Joseph's house. They're seated down in Joseph's house. And what are they doing? They're celebrating what looks to be what's a type of the Passover. Well, Jesus, when he was seated down with his 12, with his disciples, he told them, hey, there's going to be a time when we're in my, the Father's kingdom. Right? Which Jesus is the Father, right? Amen. We're going to be in the Father's kingdom, and then we're going to celebrate this meal. Then we're going to drink of the fruit of the vine, right? Then we're going to sit down, we're going to drink of the fruit of the vine. And what is it going to be? It's going to be a, a, a grand, you know, reuniting, reunification of all of our brethren. Just like all the brethren are all brought back together there, Simeon's back, right? You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but if everybody stays here at this church and the church grows and everything, there's going to be a time when people start to pass away. When, you know, Brother Elliot's may, you know, obviously Brother Elliot's moving. So we're going to forget about him for a minute, right? <laughs> we'll still love Brother Elliot. But let's, let's just, you know, let's just say, you know, the Bob's family, the Hall family, the Martinez family, they all decide to stay here. Well, there's going to be a time when Brother Anthony dies. And he's not going to be with us anymore. There's going to be a time when Brother Russell passes away and he's not here anymore, Right? Sister Bops. We're in the South, so we could say Sister Bops, right? A lot of the churches won't say sister. You know, uh, Brother Hall, he'll pass away at one point, right? It's like Simeon being taken to jail. It's like Simeon being taken away for a period of time. But how happy do you think they were when Simeon was brought back? How happy do you think Joseph was when Joseph got to see his brethren? You know, that tells me Jesus is going to be happy to see us as well. Amen. Jesus is going to be happy when, when we're all reunited. It's not only going to be us reuniting with Him and, and us being happy. Jesus loves us too. So He's going to be waiting to see us too. And He's going to be happy to see our face. And then all the brethren will be back. Just like here, you know, even the sense of Brother Elliot moving and going and starting a church, that's going to be sad when Brother Elliot leaves. That'll be sad. But there'll be a time when we all die There'll be a time, you know, 100, 200 years when we're all reunited back around Joseph's table. We're all sitting back around Jesus' table in heaven and we'll be there and all the brethren will be there. Simeon's back, Benjamin's back, Gad's back, Nephali's back, Zebulun's back, you know, Judah, all of them, Simeon, Levi, all of us will be back. Joseph's there, everybody. Issachar, I know everybody's thinking, which ones did he not name, right? I wasn't trying to do that. Everybody's back. Every brother will be there. You know? And I'm going to look over at Stephen Anderson and say, Ha! No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everybody will be there. Every, all of us. And we'll be drinking and making merry, and it will be a great time. Amen. Notice what he says. That's super interesting. He says, And when Joseph saw Benjamin... With them, he said to the ruler of his house, Bring these men home. 
Bring these men home. That's not a coincidence. He said, bring these men home. There'll be a time when we die and we'll go home. Amen. This isn't my home. Amen. You know, the Bible talks about us being strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And there'll be a time when we die, we'll all be gathered back together with all of our brethren. You know, if you have fathers, mothers that are saved, you'll get to meet them again. You'll get to see them again. And there'll be a time when all of us are back together and it'll be a merry time. Be the greatest happiness, the greatest peace that you've ever had. Joseph said, bring these men home. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the love that you have for us.